Amen. Today we're going to uh, talk about unified through persecution, Acts chapter 4 and, and, and 5. And it, it, it's interesting when you look at the book of Acts because what you see is this, this sort of progression, right? And, and, and the progression, it, it looks like this. You start with this group of believers that are baptized and they become a church and the church is devoted. The devoted church always shares the gospel. Right? Every time in Acts you look and you see this group of believers that come together and the devoted church shares the gospel, but the church sharing the gospel, the evangelistic church, experiences persecution. Which is crazy, right? But it happens all of the time in our churches. When we look out there into the world, what we find is that in different areas, the persecuted church is the church that's sharing the gospel. You know why? Because the church that's not evangelistic, the world doesn't care about Right? Nobody's coming out against the church that just sits on their duff and doesn't do anything. That's the church. They're like, you're okay to be a church as long as you don't tell me about Jesus. It's the evangelistic church that experiences persecution. The persecuted church then is what we talked about last week. And today, this week, they unify together. And I think this is so important for us to see, church, is that when you look at all of this cycle and acts, and it happens again and again and again that the devoted church shares the gospel, the evangelistic church experiences persecution, the persecuted church unifies together, the unification of the church is essentially bringing it right back to being devoted, and the purpose of the unification is so that the church can go back out and share the gospel again, knowing fully well that the evangelistic church is going to experience persecution and the persecuted church is going to have to unify together to get through that persecution. So as we look at this and we think about it in the book of Acts, I want you to see, uh, I want you to see something interesting. The world doesn't like when the church is on mission to reach lost people. When the devoted church is sharing the gospel, they will encounter persecution. What What's also interesting here is when we look at the book of Acts, what we see is that the disciples in Acts, they do what they learn from Jesus. And this is a point we could really drive home and we could spend all day here. But just quickly, what I want you to understand is I want you to see that what the apostles are doing through this whole cycle, right? So, so this is the apostles leading the church now. And what they're saying is, church, we got we to gotta devote ourselves to, to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the breaking of bread and prayer, Acts 2.42, so that we can go out and share the gospel. You know where they learned this from? From Jesus. And if you were to go back in Luke, and you can look at Luke 9 and 10, this is uh, uh, Acts is written by Luke. Luke is writing in 9 and 10. What you find is that Luke records this encounter with Christ. And in Luke chapter 9, they're devoting themselves to Jesus' teaching. And you know why they devote themselves to Jesus' teaching? And Jesus is saying, hey, do this, not do that. Do, this is the way you follow Jesus. Is because then in chapter 10, what Jesus says to the to the apostles, then disciples, he says, I'm sending you out as lambs or sheep in the midst of wolves. And if you go to Acts chapter 3 and 4, you see exactly that. Peter, John are sent out as sheep in the midst of wolves. They're going to be pounced on. Why are they sent out in Acts? To proclaim the gospel. Why did Jesus send them out in Luke? To proclaim the gospel. As you continue, Luke even has the impression you're going to experience persecution. And when you do experience persecution, why? Because you're sharing the gospel. People don't like it when you share the gospel. They're going to persecute you. Jesus says, just shake the dust off of your feet and continue to proclaim the gospel. And what do you see in Acts? They experience persecution. What do they do? Look, it's not for me to decide, but I'm going to say what I saw God do in Jesus Christ. They're going to continue to preach the gospel. And then what happens after all of this persecution? They go right back to where they started. They regroup. They unify. They again devote themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the teachings of Jesus Christ. Why? So that the process can start all the way back over and so that we can make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. All of this to say... That in the passage we read today, the main idea is something like this. Unity in the church gives us strength to continue to proclaim the gospel, dot, 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 in spite of persecution. Church, understand, persecution is going to come. And we talked about this last week when we saw that, 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 that the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the leaders, the elders, they pounced upon Peter and John as they shared the gospel. What I want you to see is Peter and John and the apostles, they know that's going to happen. And the key to getting through that persecution in the church is unity. Today in the passage we read, there's going to be five parts that I want you to see. It's a five-part progression, a pretty lengthy passage, but it's important for us to see the entire progression. First, what you'll see as we read the text in just a moment, you'll see that the, the apostles, they struggle together, right? And this is important because you'll be in a place in your life, friend, where you're going to struggle. And if you struggle alone, you're going to hurt. And if you hurt, you're going to fall away. So you struggle together. Then you pray together. 
And we pray together again because we need that strength of prayer. I, as pastor, covet your prayers, and you, as other Christians, should covet the prayers of those who are around you. We, we pray together. And once they've struggled together and prayed together, they go out again, and God grants the request of the prayer, and they evangelize together. And then we see this recap in the passage. They unify together. And the fifth thing you see, which is quite extraordinary, is once they're all unified, the devil attacks the unity of believers. This is the, one of the hardest things as a Christian to experience or see. What you find happens is that we expect persecution from the outside. Right, if we were to go back in Acts chapter 4 and we look and we say, oh look, the Sadducees, the people who killed Jesus are persecuting his followers. Well, duh, that's obvious. If I told you guys, if you went to the Middle East and preached Jesus, they're probably going to kill you. You'd say, well yeah, we, we get that, pastor. But if I told you, once you unify together as believers seeking to share the gospel, the devil's going to attack the unity from within the church. You would say, whoa, hold on. You're telling me that the devil is going to try to use somebody that's inside the church to attack the unity? I'm going to say, yeah, this is what you see in the Bible over and over again. Think about Judas, right? He was one of the apostles, one of the disciples. He attacked from within the church. Today we're going to see the devil attacks from within. I could go on and on and tell you stories. One of the saddest stories I know about a church being divided by the devil is this church in Colorado booming. Man, they were on fire for the Lord. They were growing. They got to the point where they needed a new building. So get this church on fire. They're, they're struggling, praying, evangelizing together, unified. They are, they're just going bonkers for Jesus. And they said, we've, we've outgrown our building. We've got to build a new building. And they said, okay, let's sit down and we're going to design a building. And the devil comes in. And there's one group that says, we need a building that has 18-inch eaves on the church. The other group says, no, that's too big. We only need 12-inch eaves on the church. So now, where that one church was such on fire, there stand two churches. The 18-inch eaves church and the 12-inch eaves church. Why? Because the devil attacked the unity within the church. And all the Christians are like, all that happened in all of that was that the devil fought and destroyed the unity so they could no longer go out and spread the gospel together. Such an important thing for us to understand, church. Unity allows us to get through the persecution and continue to go out and spread the gospel. Now, the text, beginning chapter 4, verse 23. Word of the Lord reads like this. When they were released, this is released from persecution. They were released from being questioned. Look at what they do. They, they were released. They went to their friends and they reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth and who made uh, who, through the mouth of your father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. And now, look, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. No one said that any one thing belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common and with great power the apostles were giving their testimony of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them for as many as were owners of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and they laid it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was called by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, he sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now watch this, disunity, the attack. Verse 1 of chapter 5. But a man named Ananias with his, with his wife Sapphira, they sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, 
Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it then that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You've not lied to men, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whatever you sold the land for, so, uh, so, for so much. And she said, yes, for, for so much. Peter said to her, how is it that you've agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all those who heard of these things. Amen and amen. May the Lord add to the blessing of the reading of his word. Again, church, big idea I want you to get as we look at these points of struggling together, praying together, evangelizing together, unifying together, because the devil is going to attack that unity. What I want you to see is that unity in the church gives us strength to continue to proclaim the gospel in spite of persecution. Again, understand if you went back last week and you listened to the sermon online or you go back and read through the passage, what you see is the, 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 the bad guys pouncing on the apostles. And we see Peter writes that, look, the devil is like a prowling lion seeking whom he may devour. And we think about that in the context of church and we know, look, we know just logically, if not biblically, even more so that alone we fall prey to the devil. So God teaches us in his word, we unify together so that we can boldly proclaim, boldly be witnesses for Jesus Christ in spite of the opposition we know is going to come our way. First point I want you to see about unifying. Struggle together. Verse 23, I think this is beautiful. It says, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. This is cool because, it, look, brief, brief, brief verse. Small, short point. But what, what I want you to see is that, look, these guys just persecuted, kept in jail overnight, threatened with their lives. Look, we're going to do to you what we did to Jesus, and we killed him. They're scared out of their mind. And what do they do? They say, we got to get to church. Why? We've got to go to our friends and tell them what happened because they're going to be able to help us. When I think about church as a pastor, I... My heart is that every one of you here would say, I've got a friend at Spring Valley Baptist Church. Like if I didn't know where to go, I, I would call this person. I would call that person. If I came to Spring Valley Baptist Church and I had a struggle in my life, I know that they would help me. The reason, you know, I, I make my cell phone number public, the reason we publish like a, a deacon of the week or a yoke fellow's phone number, whatever, in the bulletin is because we want you guys to know if you need help, we're, we're there for you. We, we want to be the friend that goes through that struggle with you. This, this church should be a safe place to share your struggles, right? Like if you have addiction that you're struggling with, let us help you get through that. If you have difficulty in your marriage, let us help you get through that. Don't don't struggle alone because when you struggle alone, it's going to be tough and the devil's going to pick you off when you're all by yourself. Struggle together and understand what that means is that we've got your back and it means that you should have somebody else's back so that all of us together, we can lock arms and we can get through whatever the devil or the world throws at us. We want to be there for you as friends to get through the difficult place. And what do friends do when they come together? They pray together. I think it's great the way, the way Luke records this. He's like, they went and they said to them, they reported. You can just hear Peter and John. They're like, hey, they did this to us and they threatened us and they, they told us not to do this anymore. But we responded with the gospel and they, they, they get back in this group. And by now, you know, you had the, the 3,000 in Acts 2. You had another 2,000 in Acts 4. This is just the number of men. There's probably thousands and thousands of people. Some went home, but they get together and they say, what do we do now? Let's lift our voices to God. Because we really don't know what we're supposed to do. There's a point in your life, friend, where you're going to get there and you're going to say, 
I've done all I know to do. What do I do now? And the answer is this. You lift your voice to God in prayer, earnest, earnest prayer. There's three things about the prayer. What it says, they, they lifted their voices together to God. And interesting, right? So unity, they're together. Three, three points about the unified prayer. First, the, the prayer is together. In, in other words, they're, they're praying of one accord. And, and what I mean by they're praying of one accord isn't just that, oh, hey, pastor's praying. Let's just all be quiet and go like this for a minute. It's that the heart of everybody there is together on that. We say, hey, let's pray for the ladies in Panama. And, and what, what does that mean we do? It means together, all of us in our own way, even, you know, maybe not out loud, but uh, some churches do that, but all of us together, lifting up our voices, God, hear our prayer. Lord, be with those ladies and work in their lives and what's happening. All of us together, unified with this object of prayer. For them, it was, hey, we got our brothers just came back. They're struggling. We want to pray for you. You come to me with a struggle, hey, let me pray with you. If, if it's together, let us, let us pray for you because I'm not really sure what to do. The second thing, the, the, the prayer request of God was, God, give us power. Give us power. Verse 29, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. You know, what's, what's interesting here is that the word boldness, it, it just goes back to earlier in the passage where the boldness of the apostles was the proclamation of the gospel. They go to the Sadducees and the Sadducees say, hey, if you don't stop, we're going to keep you in jail. And they say, you know what? Jesus died for you and he rose again. And if you would receive him as your Lord and Savior, you will get to go to heaven. And they threaten him some more. And so now that they've been threatened because they're sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, they go back and they say, God, give us the power to continue to spread your gospel even if it costs us our lives. You see, the prayer request is not, God, take away the pain. The prayer request is, God, get me through the pain so that you would be glorified in spite of that pain. And then I want you to notice the prayer request is according to God's word. Interesting, if you look here, they're even quoting God's word in their prayer request. You, you see, they, they quote the, the words of David, the king. Why do the Gentiles rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. You know what they're doing is they're, they're praying to God. They're saying, God, these are the people that killed Jesus and now they're against us too. This is what David prophesied in the Old Testament. It, it's essentially what Jesus said. We could pray, God, your, your son Jesus told us as they persecuted me, so they're going to persecute you. Lord, we're experiencing that. Help us get through it. You know what it means to us is if we want to pray according to God's word, we got to know God's word. You know, the reason we put such an emphasis on discipleship and why we put such an emphasis on, you know, make, make church a priority and, and, and be in a fellowship of believers is so we can learn how to pray according to God's word so that we can pray for power and so that we can pray united. Interesting, right? If we all pray according to God's word, we will always pray of one accord according to God's word because God's word becomes our foundation. After they pray together, they ask for boldness. God grants them their boldness. Verse 31, verse, verse, verse 31 tells us when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. I think this is cool because what we see is boldness is always in this passage Always in Acts. In fact, it's only used in this passage in all of Acts. But in this passage, it's used in conjunction with the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the filling of the Holy Spirit. Also, back from Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you'll receive power What when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what will happen? You will be my witnesses. Where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Purpose of the Holy Spirit to make you witnesses to the ends of the earth. It will give you power to do that. And so what happens? They pray. They say, God, give us your boldness. And God says, you have got it. Essentially, the prayer in verses 24 through 30 is to say to God, God, help us fulfill this command that you've given to us. And in verse 31, God says, I will grant you the request of your prayer. I will give you the boldness you need to go out into the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to notice a couple things first. With this, when we pray according to God's word, God hears our prayer and God answers. 
Look, I want you to notice when you struggle together and you pray together, God will grant your prayer and God will do amazing things through you. But know this, if we pray to God and we say, God, give us boldness to spread your word, but we never go out in front of any lost people, we're never going to experience the answer to the prayer that God has given us. Know for certain that for the apostles, for these disciples, for these new believers that, that the Bible talks about in Acts chapters 4 and 5, for them to experience that boldness and that power and that spirit-filledness, they had to step out on faith and say, God, put me in a place where I'll experience persecution, even for your word. And until we get there, we never experience that kind of spirit-filled power. Then from here what happens is it's almost like Luke takes a step back and he gives us an overview of the unity that happens. And I think it's important for us to get this, right? They, they, they unify together. Verses 32 through 37, what we see happen is, is a recap of the unity that they've experienced, right? Persecution. Persecution causes them to unify. The unify, the unity then is, is, is recapped. It says the full number were of one heart and one soul. And it continues in verses 32 through 37. And what, what Luke is doing is he's now taking a snapshot and he's showing it to us as the church, and he's saying, church, this is what the church should look like when they're going to go out and do great things for Jesus Christ. And there's three attributes of unity that are described in verses 32 through 37. It, it goes like this. They have one heart and one soul. They, they unify around the apostles' teaching, and it results in radical generosity. Look at the way it reads in verses 32 through 37. The, the full number were of one heart and one soul. None of them said that any of their things belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. It's interesting that the, the, the early church, they looked around and they said, I want to make sure that my brothers are as well cared for as I am. That their life is living in a satisfied way. It, it, it tells us that with great power in verse 33, that that. that the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Great grace was upon them all. They, they were under the apostles' teaching. They were, uh, again, devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. And then the, the radical generosity that we see in verse 34, there was not a needy person among any of the people there. As we look at the unity, the, the first one, they were of one heart and soul. Look, one guy, he, he said it like this, the church doesn't create unity, the church maintains unity. And the reason is because we are unified, church, because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray often, God, we thank you for the fellowship that we share in Christ Jesus. You know why the reason we unify together is because Jesus died for your sins like he died for my sins. Jesus rose again on the third day, and because I've received him as my Lord and Savior, because you've received him as your Lord and Savior, we are under the control of Jesus Christ. What that means is if you're here and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you can never unify with the church. Not really. Not really unify. The foundation of the unity that we have, this one heart and this one soul, is because of the blood of Jesus Christ that binds us together. This is why we can unify across age ranges. This is why we can unify across ethnicities or across uh, uh, cultural differences. This is why we can unify with all kinds of different people from all places in the world together. Why? Because the unity of our church, the unity of any church, of God's church, is not based on any one individual but on the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on that old rugged cross. Second, it's according to the apostles' doctrine, according to the apostles' teaching. Did, did you notice the, the, the great power they were giving their testimony? The unity of the church finds its foundation on the teaching of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the apostles. This is why we go verse by verse through the Bible. This is why we have D groups. This is why we have Sunday school. Because if it was all up to my opinion and my, uh, my whims, right, some of you guys would disagree. But when we put it to the Bible and we say this is what we're trying to do, this is what we're trying to accomplish, it's according to what God's word says, then, then we say, look, I may not like it, but it's what God says. I may not quite understand it, but it's what God says, and it's what we're going to do. And then it's nothing personal, and then it re results in radical generosity. There's this guy mentioned there, his name is Joseph. And most of you guys have probably never heard of Joseph, but probably everybody has heard of Barnabas. 
The apostles called this guy Joseph Barnabas because it means son of encouragement. You ever wondered how Barnabas got his name? I think it was this. Barnabas was this guy who, he got Jesus. He was a Levite, which means he was a Jew. He was even of the priestly lineage. He was the guy who had been against Jesus, but he was sold out. He said, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and I am going to give everything for him. And he looks out there in the church, and he says, I see a brother who's in need, and I see a sister who needs some help, and I see that there's missionaries who need to be sent. And he says, so I'm going to sell my field because I'm not using it. And he takes the money, and he's like, hey, we could use this for Jesus, and it's awesome. And he's so excited to use it for God's will, and it's like, that guy's an encourager. Your name's Joseph, but we're going to call you Barnabas. And from then on, Barnabas is this guy who is the symbol for encouragement in the New Testament church. I think sometimes God sends Barnabases to our churches. Um, some of you all I know just have a heart for generosity and, and, and God uses that and it's encouraging and maybe it's encouraging in a different way, but, but God uses that radical generosity in our life. This is unity. It's when all of the church comes together. Now, understand unity is only possible with these three attributes, right? Without Jesus Christ and his blood binding us together, we cannot be unified. Without, without following first and foremost the apostles teaching the word of God, we cannot be unified. And without putting God's people before ourselves, that's radical generosity, we cannot be unified. This, then, is a high point in Scripture. Right, again, if, if you remember back last week, if you were here, I told you that often the devil attacks after a high point. It's going to happen again in Acts chapter 5. And, and, and I want you to see that this is, man, it's, it's been amazing, right? They were persecuted, but so what? Now they're, they're unified, they're, 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 they're struggling together, they're praying together, they're evangelizing together. Their unity is just all-encompassing and nobody's wanting for anything. And they're like, praise God, it's awesome to be a Christian. And then, boom, devil attacks. Really, from the inside this time. This time, the devil attacks from the inside. And we see this passage that's written to Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And the apostles say to him, Ananias, verse 3, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? I want you to understand what's happening. The, the but that begins, verse 1 of chapter 5, it's this adversative but. In other words, the writer Luke, what he's wanting to see is that, hey, there's Barnabas over here who's this son of encouragement. Barnabas is the guy that every Christian wants to be like. And, you know, Barnabas is not the guy who did it for attention, but because he was that encouraging guy, people are looking and they're saying, hey, check out Barnabas. And then you get this other couple over there, Ananias and Sapphira, and they're like, hey, do you see what Barnabas is getting all this attention? Maybe we can do what Barnabas did and we'll get attention too. Yeah, but I'm not sure I want to give all of it to them because, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit greedy. So uh, let's, let's just pretend that we're going to do what Barnabas did so we get the attention that Barnabas got. And what the apostles say is, why did Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? Two, two things. First, the, the devil uses hypocrisy. Really, the sin that is here is, is, is hypocrisy. This is an issue of hypocrisy, right? Hypocrisy threatens to disrupt unity, John later writes, Peter writes about the devil prowling around like a roaring lion or giant. John, who's also there. John, I, I, think, I think the apostles, when they wrote their epistles, they wrote the letters, they're thinking back about their experiences. John, he writes this in 1 John 2, 9. He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not all of us. You know, what John is saying is that we know that in the church there's going to be hypocrites come from time and time again. And that you see they're hypocrites because they leave the faith ultimately. What we see happen with Ananias and Sapphira, they were part of the group. And as part of the group, they lied to the group to cause disunity within the group. I want you to see six attributes of hypocrisy from Ananias and Sapphira. First, fake piety. Fake, fake, pie, fake, fake holiness. Fake holiness. Ananias and Sapphira, they sold a property. With his wife's knowledge, they uh, kept back for themselves some of the proceeds, only brought part of it to the apostles' feet. What, what, what's going on? 
They didn't have to sell the field, right? First of all, understand, they didn't have to sell the field. Jesus never said, everybody sell all of your stuff and give it all. To don't, that's not true. Listen, church, you don't have to sell anything and give it to God. Next of all, when you sell something, they were not required to bring any of it to the, the apostles' feet. It wasn't a requirement. What's the fake piety? It's that they conspired to say, let's sell our field so we can look like Barnabas, and then let's only give part of it to the apostles. Right? We sold it for 100 bucks. We're going to put $10 there and said, look at us. We're so holy. <laughs> it's fake. They're wearing masks. Second, they're attention seekers. Again, for the same reason that we see fake uh, uh, piety, fake holiness, their attention Look at me. You could go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, he talks about the, uh, the, the, the people that are, are giving their money away, the, the Pharisees and the, the hypocrites. And he calls them hypocrites. And he says, they sound a horn. Dun, da, da, I'm going to give away some money. <laughs> Everybody look at me. And Jesus says, they've, they've got their reward. They don't get anything in heaven. Again, if the only reason somebody gives is so they can get attention for giving, and I'm not just talking about money, but anything else, if the only reason one of us does anything is so we can get attention from other people, it's not the right reason. That's a hypocritical reason. Third, they're liars. Verses 3 and 4 describes the, the lying of them. Peter said, Ananias, why, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? To keep back part of the proceeds. Verse 4, while it remained unsold, did it not belong to you? It is not your own. After it was sold, what is it not at your disposal? You see what, what Peter's saying is, Ananias, why are you lying to God? It, it, it's the same with us. If, if you lie about doing something for God, you're not lying to Pastor Steve. Don't ever think, oh, I pulled a fast one over on the pastor. If that's ever the case, you've really pulled a fast one over on God. The hypocrites are, are liars. Third, they're greedy. They're greedy. The, the, the mindness of the money, the, me keeping my money meant more than me glorifying God. Me getting attention meant more than me glorifying God. Me looking holy meant more than me glorifying God. Fifth, they were deceptive, scheming. Th this is like a layer on top of lying. It's not like they got up there and you know, just told a little white lie, but what you see in the progression is that Ananias and Sapphira, husband and wife, they're like whispering, hey, let's, let's hold back some of the money. It's going to look really cool. I'll tell this story. You tell that story. We'll come at separate times so they really believe it. And they've got all of their I's dotted, all of their T's crossed. They're like, nobody's going to see this coming. We've got it. Deceptive, scheming. Third, we find their tools for the devil. This is important for us to see, right? We expect the opposition from the outside. But sometimes the devil uses somebody inside as his tool to disrupt the unity that allows the church to move forward in Jesus Christ. What I want to tell you next is the cure for hypocrisy. Cure for hypocrisy? Fear God. The cure for hypocrisy is the fear of the Lord. I want you to know that when I read these passages, look, I, I don't read God's word casually. When I read this, and you'll see in verse 7 and following, really even, you know, verse, verse 5, when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all that heard it. Verse 9, Peter said to her, to Sapphira, how is it you've agreed to test the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry your, uh, you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And great fear fell upon all of the group of the people. Church, when I, when I read that, I take it with all seriousness. I fear God more than I fear any of you. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that my, my desire to make God happy outweighs the desire to make anybody else happy. Why? Because he's God. And when you want to stop hypocrisy in your own life or in somebody else's life, understand that the fear of God is where it begins. There's a passage in Psalms 
Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Today, look, to may, today maybe, maybe you've looked at this and you've thought, I've got hypocrisy in my own life that I need to deal with. Let me tell you that now's the time to deal with this. Even, even Christian, look, if you've thought maybe you could get away with something because, because you're a Christian or it's just a little white lie, understand, brother and sister, you will stand before God Almighty. I will stand before the Lord God Almighty, and each of us is going to have to own up to everything that we did. Look, you won't be unsaved because you've sinned, but you're going to stand before God, and it should incite fear in the bones of a believer to think, I'm going to stand before God Almighty knowing of the sin in my life. Today is the day to get right with God. Maybe you're here today and you think, I'm not a hypocrite like that, but I'm not really saved. And let me tell you, you can never truly unify with believers without Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Look, if you're here today and you're not saved, let me show you in God's Word how you can trust Jesus Christ. Know for sure that He died on the cross for your salvation. And if you would cry out to Him and say, Lord, I, I trust you. God, I know I'm a sinner. And I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior today that God will save you and allow you that kind of unity in your life. Today, I'm going to ask that you would stand with me. We'll respond as the music plays. Father, God, Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. God, we thank you for the fellowship that we share in him. God, we thank you for that unity. Lord, as we each just search our own souls, Father, I pray that you would purge us of the hypocrisy that is in our own lives. Lord, just take it away. Help us to push away those, those things. Lord, even the little things that go against your word that we might be fully sold out for you, just like Barnabas. God, I pray if there's any here today who do not know Jesus Christ, that they would know today is the day of salvation. We thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, amen.